we've got uh, very high quality assets in this company, uh, but I think that it takes center stage, uh, certainly for 2023. And uh, Parker Villas is moving through the permitting cycle, which is obviously a big value builder to have a, a large bulk tonnage project permitted in Canada. Well, hello and welcome to viewers to this edition of Assay TV, where we're featuring an insight on Cisco development. And I'm delighted to be hosting Mr. Sean Rusin, CEO and Chairman of the Board, also the Executive Chair of the Board of Cisco Gold Royalties. And of course, Sean is a frequently listed uh, character amongst mining's top 20 most influential individuals. So, of course, great to have him on the show. Sean, a very warm welcome to you. Thanks very much, Adam, and uh, glad to be here, especially in these gold environments. Indeed, it's a very interesting time for the market. So um, we can perhaps talk about that um, in a little bit as well. But look, um, we want to get down into uh, some overview of the companies here and looking at the success of what you've done building the Malarctic mine, now Canada's largest gold mine. Uh, the name of Cisco and mining is synonymous uh, within this industry. Um, could you share an insight, though, to how a Cisco development came together and how that fits within the broader a Cisco group of companies? Certainly, Adam. I started out as, a, uh, <clears throat> as an underground miner at the age of 18. I uh, went to a place called the Haleberry School of Mines for mining engineering technology. Um, worked most of my career uh, on development assets. Uh, and uh, we started the Cisco Group really in 2003 uh, from my private equity group, Eurasia Holdings. So I transitioned from being a, a technical person into being more of a, a strategic developer and on into uh, mine finance, if you will, uh, for the last 23 years. Um, in 03, we found and uh, founded Cisco, which was a really a $500,000 company, not a $500 million company. Um, and we were fortunate enough that we acquired the property of the Canadian Arctic uh, in 2004 uh, through a bankruptcy process. We bought it for a little over $80,000. And uh, uh, in 2004, we started to work on the compilation of historic data, which is really our specialty. We consider ourselves to be uh, brownfield uh, specialists in terms of going into old mining camps with good mineral endowment and unlocking uh, the potential of those camps uh, based on new technology. Uh, and new interpretations as well as the consolidated land packages that often happen over time. Um, the Canadian Arctic was our first big success. Uh, we thought at the beginning in 2005, we had maybe had four or 500,000 ounces. Uh, we published a, a resource of about 4.3 million ounces on the first pass from historic data. Uh, and then uh, things uh, took off from there. It became evident that the Canadian Arctic camp had a huge endowment, though it'd be low grade. Uh, and there weren't really that many low-grade bulk tonnage open pit mines in the Canadian mining scene at the time. So we were kind of the pioneers of the model for Canada, uh, if you will. And we ended up publishing a preliminary feasibility study or final feasibility study in, 2000, in November of 2008. Uh, and we pretty much shot the eyes out of the financial crisis. Uh, and we published a resource of about 8.43 million ounces. Uh, mm -hmm. And we went on to really sort of break the back of the equity financings in February of 09 with one of the largest equity deals done at the time, $403 million uh, with another $240 million worth of warrants that were seven months out. And we built uh, Canadian Malartic in 2011. Uh, we commissioned it and uh, we ran it till 2014. Um, and we ramped it up at the time. It was uh, headed for 700,000 ounces a year of production. Uh, we got into a hostile bid with Gold Corp in the spring of 2014. Um, and uh, we ended up selling the company to Humana and Agnico uh, for about uh, con total consideration of about $4.1 billion, including $500 million for a royalty company called now called Cisco Gold Royalties, uh, which was the spin co from that transaction. Um, the discovery that we did at KM Arctic has now ended up being far more important than what we actually sold it for. During the hostile, we had a discovery called the Goldie Zone, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, the Goldie Zone and the uh, Odyssey Zone, which has now resulted in another 14 million plus ounces uh, having been uh, found there, bringing a total endowment at Canadian Arctic north of 30 million ounces uh, uh, since the historic production plus what's been found uh, since we got involved in 2003. Uh, so it's been an extraordinary asset and continues to be uh, a cornerstone asset now for Agnico that owns it 100% uh, as of this year. 
a quite a, quite a story and uh, one of the great uh, great uh, pleasures of my life is to be uh, the CEO of that group as we went through that. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Thank you for the rundown and the history of it there. Look, thinking about sort of when you started this and where we're at now and your point about the markets and and, and gold price at the moment, how does this moment feel versus some of the other cycles that you've obviously passed through as a financier and a developer and a, and a project owner? Yeah. Well, it's a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit analysis to what we would have seen in 2003, 2004, uh, when we felt like the gold market was coming back after it hit, you know, in 99, 2000, it hit below 300, $300 an ounce. We had a bit of a shake up in 2020 through 2021. Uh, then with the pandemic, gold prices did rise. Uh, and we see, you know, the gold prices have continued to do their job in terms of affecting value uh, as financial crisis and pandemic uh, have uh, shown some weakness in, in various parts of the economy. And most recently, uh, three big banks going down in sequence. Uh, with Credit Suisse being the most recent 167-year-old bank having disappeared last weekend. Um, you know, so there are a lot of a lot of the reasons that gold is, is of value is for times like this when you really don't know what you're getting uh, on institutional investment. Uh, so gold has done its job. It's over $1,900 an ounce again. I suspect that we have a good shot here at seeing 2000 to 2100 this year. Uh, if there are any more dominoes to fall, crisis with the banks and if confidence is stricken against the US dollar uh, with all the things that are going on uh, in the world especially with the BRIC nations and the amount of momentum that the BRIC currencies are gaining. Yep absolutely excellent okay very good Let, let's phone in, hone in then on the on the projects last year you acquired the prospective uh, Tintic project in Utah um, it's immediately next to Ivanhoe's electric property in the Southwest. Could you explain for viewers the rationale behind the acquisition, the history of East Tintic, and then also what's the strategy in evolving this project? So Cisco Development was relaunched uh, in 2020, uh, and it had in it the Caribou Gold Project and the San Antonio in, in Central British Columbia, quite a large project in one of the bigger mining camps that we we're working on, uh, as well as the... Uh, near-term heat bleach project in San Antonio, Mexico, uh, with a sulfide project underneath it. So that was two good projects in the company. Uh, the third project that we were uh, quite keen to bring in is the Tintic project, which is a project that we've been pursuing really since 2010. So you know, over, overnight success in 12 years uh, to get that deal done. And it's quite an extraordinary property. It's the ex-Kennecott property about 40 miles south of Bingham. Uh, which is North America's largest and most productive uh, cor copper gold multi-element uh, porphyry uh, mm -hmm. system that's been mined and is the reason that Salt Lake is where it is. Uh, and it's a, you know one of the key assets in the world. It's produced over 41 million ounces of gold uh, as a byproduct of 25 uh, billion pounds of copper. Um, and so it's you know quite an extraordinary mineral endowment that's in this area. We're on strike with Bingham. We're in the same age rocks as Bingham. We're about 40 miles south. The difference between Bingham and what we were looking at at Tintic is we think that the porphyry at Bingham was eroded down to the top of the, of the carapace of the porphyry. That is the sort of the fluid cap that sits on top of these large, por large porphyries. Uh, and that is the reason that Bingham was an open pit. Uh, what we're hoping to see is to test the idea that there is a copper gold polymetallic porphyry sitting underneath uh, the properties at Tintic. Tintic had 23 previous producers on the property, which we believe were all distillate from the under, underlying porphyry. Um, and that I believe is why Robert is there, uh, Friedland, Robert Friedland with the Ivanhoe Electric to the south of this. He's made uh, very, you know, very big uh, uh, opening statements about what he thinks the potential of the Tintic belt is. We agree with him uh, on the science. Uh, we're a little bit to the north of where he is drilling. Um, he, we are we are share a border with him on the same porphyry free targets. Uh, we have about seventeen thousand acres of patented land there, of which fourteen thousand is directly owned uh, by the company, and three thousand is under lease. And uh, we're currently uh, happy that there was a large high grade discovery, um, relatively large high grade discovery, uh, in one of the end members of the previous gold producer. So there was five previous gold producers here, of which. Uh, the tint, the uh, the tintic belt uh, sits in the middle, and the gold pro mines are off to the to the eastern border, and they all follow along the main structure. 
Uh, and the least known one of the projects was called Trixie, it had the lowest grade of all the historic gold mines. But however, it's produced this new discovery uh, that's called the, the T2, T4 structures, Trixie 2 and Trixie 4. Um, that host uh, one of the higher grade mineral resources that I've ever been involved with. Uh, we published a, a, a three-stage capped uh, resource, MRE, <clears throat> here in January uh, that uh, had lined with uh, 213,000 ounces at 28 grams gold per ton, uh, which was by far the highest grade of any published resource reserve uh, in the space at present, and another 240,000 ounces of inferred resource of around 20 grams. This thing is really shallow. It's about 190 meters down or 625 feet. And we currently have a ramp down 60% of the vertical distance to that. And we should be in the deposit with the ramp by June. We do, however, have access into the deposit uh, as we speak today uh, that uh, comes from the shaft that was there. And that's how the discovery was made. Uh, the previous owners had driven a drill drift perpendicular to the strike of this uh, this main structure about 150 meters back and they had crossed over what became the T2 discovery structure, which had multi kilos per ton. Uh, we, uh, so we also lined out about 240 meters of strike length along the deposit and we put cross cut ribs in the deposit and we sampled from within the deposits better than diamond drilling were actually in the deposit. And we took 4,550 samples, uh, chip samples from the underground within the deposit and the average grade was 74 grams gold per ton and 94 grams silver, which we would expect to see in this porphyry system uh, yeah. in terms of, uh, of a high sulfidation uh, uh, epithermal zone that uh, bo so is a boiling zone, if you will, uh, and has been an extraordinary discovery uh, uh, we're uh, currently working on, and we'll be putting that into some test mining as we speak. It's already from test mining, and just on the development muck, has produced about 35,000 ounces of gold uh, at plus one ounce per ton just from the actual development work, not from scoping or mining. Mm, fantastic. Um, so from the 30,000 foot view of this uh, Tintic property, you know, it looks like there's going to be a, a really big porphyry potential here. Would you say that's accurate? Well, we certainly hope so. The, we have uh, every every component. Uh, we've had both Dick Silito and Ruben Padilla, quite famous porphyry specialists. Uh, Dick Silito wrote the original white paper on porphyry discoveries in the mid nineties. This is one of his top targets and he's the one that brought this opportunity to the group back in 2010. Uh, so we're quite keen to drill it and we will start drilling as the weather gets better. Uh, the target depth is between five and 800 meters to the top of the porphyry. So we'll be drilling quasi thousand meter holes which are not that deep today. Um, but when they stopped mining at Kennecott in 1995 here, they stopped because of the water zone which at the time was about 400 meters or about 1,350 feet. And at the time they never mined it for gold per se, they were mining for flux to feed the Bingham smelter. And they were trying to have enough gold content within the high quality silica to pay for the mining. Uh, so there's very little exploration done within the gold boil zone. Uh, there were 18 previous polymetallic deposits in the, in the shales called you know, carbonate replacement deposits that were polymetallic silver, lead, zinc, uh, silver, lead, and zinc. Um, there's a couple of those deposits that are still left, one called the Bergen that we also see in this, in this uh, suite of assets. There's a significant amount of opportunities in all fronts, the high-grade gold zones that we believe exist up and down this contact zone on the eastern border, uh, as well as some of these replacement zones that exist within, within the sedimentary cap. There was never any outcropping discoveries on this project, so everything was discovered either through pebble dike prospecting or, or by sinking shaft. Mm -hmm. uh, on the property. So it's quite an interesting one. There's 150 miles of, of underground workings to go from. Uh, we're taking advantage of those underground workings in the current Trixie discovery. Uh, and we're actually underground down to a level of 750 feet there. And the shaft goes down to uh, 1,350. So there's significant amount of, of uh, value in the existing underground infrastructure, as well as our big hope, which is to test this port free concept uh, as we get further into the project. Yep. Excellent upside there. Okay, brilliant. So shifting over to British Columbia, so we've got to get through your projects here. Um, you recently published a feasibility study for Caribou, which you referenced before. Could you talk about how you see that project um, evolving and what you're focused on there in 2023? Certainly. It's one of the bigger uh, undeveloped gold deposits in, in the world and certainly in North America. 
uh, and is one of the assets that's quite scalable and we believe it can become a tier one asset, which would be defined by being able to support four to 500,000 ounces a year of, of production. Uh, we're in the early stages of this project. It's a consolidated land package that took years and years of patchwork consolidation to put together over 2,000 square kilometers or about 500,000 acres. Uh, but more importantly to that, there's about 83 kilometers of mineralized trend and the current uh, resource that we published of 2 million, 2.1 million ounces of reserves, another 1.7 million ounces measured and indicated. So the 2 million ounces in reserves is really in the near surface component down to about 350 meters or a thousand feet. We've tested the mineral mineralization down to a vertical depth of 900. Uh, the mineralization continues and it's fairly predictable, extremely homogenous. And we've modeled it in what are called vange corridors, which are essentially hydrothermal fluids that have gone into the cracks of the anticlinal structures. So really just a sort of a, a fault, if you will, that's been injected with the gold rich material. And the average grade of all the intercepts after 700,000 meters of drilling in the, in the quartz veins is actually 11 grams, a little over 11 grams. So we're able to use that to take those, those zones and mine them under bulk tonnage. So I expect that 2023 will be an aha uh -huh year for the market on this asset uh, as we get further into it. We're currently in the final stages of the EA program we're hoping to have the A certificate by August. So we've been in the AA process um, for this will be the third year. Uh, the two projects that were ahead of us have uh, received all their certificates. Uh, so we're the next in line and the government of BC has been extremely supportive about making this uh, the next project that receives its EA approvals. And we expect to have construction released sometime in Q1 of 2023. So this is the end of a long sort of process. We stopped drilling at roughly the 350 level. 350 meter level, but the deposit continues on well past a thousand meters at depth. Uh, so we expect this to be one of the more important assets as we go forward. Uh, the goal right now is to take, get a ramp in and take an underground sample, uh, which is fully permitted right now. And we have, we're implying two new technologies, uh, the road header technology, which is a, a tunneling machine, uh, somewhat along the lines of what our friend Elon Musk has uh, been working with. And also to use the ore sorter, which is a both an optical and an XRF sorter that uh, mechanically sorts things that's similar to what you would see at the airport. When your baggage gets surveys, we can see the sulfides within the rock. And with a pulse of air, we can select that piece of rock and put it into a separate collector. Uh, with that little pulse of air, we'll inject that and, and move it over. And it's a relatively low cost and environmentally friendly way uh, to reduce the footprint of both the tailings uh, as well as its low cost. And it's a one to $2 a ton process fee. So those two technologies are really uh, adapted to this project. As the people at Steinhardt and Palmer have said, the, the, uh, the Caribou Gold project and the mineralogy there is the poster child uh, for ore sorter technology because there's a density differential of about one. So the, the waste rock is about half the weight uh, on volume basis as the actual mineralization. So quite a bit going on with this project and a huge opportunity for shareholders uh, as we unlock that project. Yeah, we refer to it internally as the Canadian Arctic of the underground. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent opportunity there. Okay, very good. Well, look, we haven't got long left, but I wanted to move on to your uh, project in Mexico, um, in Sonora, the San Antonio project there. If you could share an update there as well. Certainly, it's a low cost, uh, low capex heat bleach project uh, to start with. It's about 300,000 ounces of oxide and transition material. Uh, on a 1.1 million ounce resource. The rest of it is in the sulfides. The grade's quite high at 0.9 grams in the oxide and 1.2 to 1.3 grams in the sulfides. Uh, we think that the, the sulfide component is currently at about 700,000 ounces uh, to 800,000 ounces. And we think there's significant upside to, to continue to do that. We've only done seven, uh, 27,000 meters of drilling there, uh, but it is significant upside within the project. But obviously uh, we've got... Uh, very high quality assets in this company, uh, but I think that it takes center stage, uh, certainly for 2023. And uh, Barker Villas is, is moving through the permitting cycle, which is obviously a big value builder to have a, a large bulk tonnage project permitted in Canada uh, during these current mold, mold markets. So I think you know, we've got the catalyst uh, for shareholders to see a lot of value accrued this year. Okay, excellent to get an overview of all your projects there, Sean. Can we just delve into the company financials and the shareholder registry as well for interested investors and viewers? Yeah, it's an interesting uh, share structure. 40% uh, of the stock is currently held by 
uh, Osisco Gold Royalties, the mother company of the company of uh, the Osisco Group. Uh, so a large shareholder there, as well as a significant component of, uh, of qualified retail investors, so a lot of U.S.-based investors uh, because of the U.S. asset. Uh, over 1,600 individuals participated in the non-brokered retail round, and that group owns about 20% uh, of the company, as well as about uh, just under 20% belongs to the IT Tintic shareholders who sold us uh, the Tintic asset. So uh, very well-held uh, uh company uh, with a lot of shareholders who are very interested to see what happens at Tintic. Uh, so it is a little bit thinly traded, but it is listed on the NYSE as well as the TSFB. Uh, so one of the few companies of this scale, we're about a $400 million uh, Canadian market cap, 400, 450, and about, you know, called 300 million US plus uh, market cap. But we think that there's uh, quite a bit of room to grow this company. Uh, there's quite a value gap out there and it's a, it's a good shareholder base. Uh, and certainly very uh, dedicated to the cause in terms of unlocking Tintic, uh, Caribou, and eventually San Antonio. So uh, yeah, have a look at the shareholder registry because I think it is somewhat unique in the space. Yeah, excellent. Very much. Uh, we urge viewers to do that. Excellent. Well, Sean, thanks so much for speaking with us. And it's fantastic to get an overview of the elements of the Cisco development business. Lots of catalysts here as well for interested investors. So thanks for speaking with SATB. Thank you very much and uh, the good work that you do at SATV.